Abbey Road is the world's oldest and most famous recording studio. In the 10 decades in which it has operated, it has built up an unparalleled track record of technical innovation and music-changing recordings. Abbey Road is obviously most famous as the place where the Beatles weaved their magic from June 1962 to April 1970. They recorded almost all of their legendary and music-changing singles and albums at Abbey Road, from their first number one, Please Please Me, to Abbey Road, the last album they recorded completely at the studio. It was the Beatles' Abbey Road album that turned the studio into a household name across the world. Helped by the band walking across the zebra crossing close to the studio on the morning of August the 8th, 1969, a rather uneventful event that resulted in one of the most famous album covers of all time. The studio was called EMI Recording Studios at the time, but as the Abbey Road name became iconic and more and more people turned up at the Zebra Crossing to walk across the same hallowed markings as the Beatles, the studio bowed to the inevitable. And in 1976, it renamed itself Abbey Road Studios. Since then, the Zebra Crossing and the studio have become main tourist attractions in London and one of the most famous musical landmarks in the world. While Abbey Road Studios continues to be closely associated with the legend of the Beatles, there is far more to the studio than that. It was at the heart of early developments in recording technology in the 30s, played a central role in the British war effort during the 40s, and became a pioneer of tape recording technology in the 50s, 60s, and 70s and the studio's technical innovations continue to this day. During the 92 years of Abbey Road's existence, countless legends of music have recorded at the studio. They include famous classical musicians and composers like Sir Edward Elgar, Arthur Schnabel, Sergei Prokofiev, Yehudi Menuhin, Yasha Heifetz, Igor Stravinsky, Pablo Casals, all during the pre-World War II years. Numerous legends of pop and rock music also found their way to the studio, starting in the 60s with Cliff Richards, The Hollies, The Beatles, Pink Floyd, and Deep Purple. In the 70s, there were Paul McCartney, Pink Floyd, Fela Kuti, Al Stewart, The Alan Parsons Project, and many more. The 80s saw artists like Kate Bush, Pink Floyd, and Rush active at the studio, and the 90s, Radiohead, Nick Cave, Alanis Morissette, and Coldplay. The list of legendary people and bands recorded at Abbey Road continues to grow, and today includes names like Adele, Muse, Nigel Kennedy, Frank Ocean, The Killers, Andrea Bocelli, Lady Gaga, Florence and the Machine, and there's also film scoring recordings for Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, and many other blockbuster movies. Abbey Road is undoubtedly one of the great recording studios in the world today. What sets it apart and makes it iconic is its incredible history, with many musical projects that have played a crucial role in shaping modern music and our culture in general. Artists tend to talk about the studio in terms of awe and reverence. Nile Rodgers, for example, called the studio mythical. Kate Bush used the word magical. Dave Grohl called it the mother church of rock and roll. Florence Welch spoke about a semi-devotional atmosphere. Elton John called the place sacred and so on. Visiting Abbey Road is a unique experience, unlike any other. With this video and several others, we would like to transmit some of that magic and mystique to you. To begin with, we need to trace the studio's origins. Abbey Road is the world's very first purpose-built studio, and it was built to take advantage of the new electrical recording equipment that had been developed in the 1920s. As we shall see as we trace the events in North London of the last hundred years, new recording technologies push new developments in the studio practices, which in turn push new developments in music and in culture in general. Over the course of almost a century, Abbey Road was at the heart of these developments, both instigating them and reacting to them. The pre-Abbey Road period in music recording is often described as the acoustic era, which was characterized by purely mechanical equipment. The very first sound recording had been made as far back as 1857 in France by Edouard Lyon Scott de Martinville on something he called Fon Autograph. Thomas Edison in 1877 was the first to invent a device, the phonograph, that could also play back sound, 
Other important inventors who contributed to the making of the phonograph work for the mass production of music included Emile Berliner and Alexander Graham Bell. The core principle was to capture sound with a horn, which would make a membrane or diaphragm vibrate. A stylus attached to the diaphragm would then engrave the vibrations onto a soft material, a wax, paper, or soft metal. The first medium on which sound was reproduced and sold in large quantities were cylinders. With the standard size at one of 10 centimeter height and five centimeter diameter, they were literally a case of canned music. By the 1910s, the cylinders were increasingly replaced by discs. These acoustic recordings were of low quality, only capable of recording and playing back between 250 hertz and 2,500 hertz, and required voices and instruments that were very loud. Musicians had to sit close to the horn in a small room to be able to give the stylus enough energy to move and cut into the recording material. The only way to balance the sound was the placement of the musicians in relation to the horn. For all these reasons, recordings with the full orchestra were impossible. In the early 1920s, Western Electric in the US developed electrical recording gear, specifically the condenser microphone, invented in 1916, as well as signal amplifiers. In addition, the first ribbon and moving coil microphones were introduced in 1923. Recordings were still mechanically cut into a disc, but capturing sound with several microphones and sending it through amplifiers resulted in the invention of mixers and EQ. So the sounds from several microphones could be balanced and adjusted. The fidelity was much improved with a frequency band of 60 Hz to 6000 Hz, and the development of the much more sensitive microphone made it possible for much softer sounds to be recorded, giving rise to vocalists who crooned and whispered, while the use of multiple microphones allowed the recordings and balancing of larger ensembles in much larger rooms. The development of electrical recording gear inspired the idea of a dedicated recording studio. A recording studio had in fact already been set up in 1898 in Covent Garden in central London by American musician and sound engineer Fred Gaysberg. He worked for an inventor and businessman named Emile Berliner, who in that same year founded the Gramophone Company Limited in London. Gaysberg's recording studio was the first space dedicated purely to recording. Until then, recordings were always made on location, obviously using the mechanical equipment of the day. However, when the realization dawned that electrical recording systems with multiple microphones made recordings of big ensembles in larger spaces possible, Trevor Osmond Williams, manager of the International Artist Department and the technical department of the Gramophone Company, lobbied for the construction of a purpose-built studio that would be large enough to hold a full orchestra. Williams had overcome concerns that the emergence of radio was fatally undermining the recording industry and opposition from Gaysberg, by now artistic director of the HMV division, aka the famous His Master's Voice label that the Gramophone Company had started in 1909. Gaysberg declared it madness to sink a large sum of money into studios and offices in an unstable economic climate but Williams won the support of the company's board and the search was on for the perfect location for the studio. The Gramophone Company had by this point already started building a technical department in Hayes, in the outskirts of West London. A member of this department, an F.H. Dart, was put in charge of the new recording project. Initially, it seemed logical to build an extension of the Hayes premises. However, a location closer to the center of London was deemed more practical, as access would be easier for the musicians and audience that were expected to frequent the place. Eventually, on December the 3rd, 1929, the company acquired a nine-bedroom Georgian townhouse built in 1831 for 16,500. It was located at 3 Abbey Road in the St. John's Wood area, which was just outside the city center. The building at 3 Abbey Road was chosen because it had a huge garden at the back, where a large recording studio could be built. The plan was in fact to build three recording studios as well as mastering rooms, listening areas, offices, lounges, and reception areas. To accommodate all of this, neighboring 5 Abbey Road and adjacent gardens were also purchased. Working to designs created by a company called Wallace, Gilbert & Partners, builders took two years to complete all the work at a total cost of close to £100,000, about five million in today's money. Much of the studio design was experimental, as a dedicated studio had never been constructed. 
Inevitably, many errors were made, and particularly the acoustics of the big studio space. Studio One took decades to sort out. In March of 1931, the Gramophone Company merged with the Columbia Gramophone Company to form EMI, short for Electric and Musical Industries Limited. The inclusion of the word electric in the name was a reference to the electrical recording gear which everyone understood was now revolutionising the recording industry. The fact that the word was included on equal terms with the word musical also illustrates the company's awareness that technological development and musical development were going hand in hand, as would be amply illustrated during the studio's 92-year history. Some test recordings already took place at what was to be named EMI Recording Studios before its grand opening on November the 12th, 1931. A press release was sent out for the event, stating not only that the studio belonged to his master's voice, but also proudly proclaiming a number of, at the time, impressive technical details. The building of these new studios has been a great effort, embodying the result of years of research by specially trained staff at the Gramophone Company's vast factory at Hayes, Middlesex. Three studios have been built in order to accommodate the different categories of music which have to be recorded from day to day. The medium and large studios have formidable stages, the latter having a platform to accommodate 250 musicians, while the auditorium will accommodate a thousand people. The walls of these studios are specifically designed to give correct resonance to all the sounds and prevent any echo. Just over four and a half miles of cable connects the three studios with a central control room. Six microphones can be used at any one time in each studio and each microphone has a separate control. On opening day, famous British composer Sir Edward Elgar conducted the London Symphony Orchestra to record his Falstaff Suite. The newly opened EMI recording studios quickly attracted the cream of the classical world, despite the fact that a significant amount of classical musicians remained deeply distrustful of the recording medium, which they saw as a threat to their live performance careers. Those that did make it to EMI studios often found the recording process a major challenge, because no edits were possible. Performers had to play pieces perfectly, resulting in many retakes and wasted wax discs. The higher quality of the electrical recordings also showed up any flaws in more detail. Piano legend Arthur Schnabel was one of those who had misgivings about the entire raison d'etre of recording, but Fred Gainsbourg managed to lure him to EMI Studios with a proposal of recording all 32 Beethoven piano sonatas at Studio 3. However, the pianist found the pressure of having to play perfectly so taxing that he ended up close to a nervous breakdown. Because the 78 RPM disc could only contain a maximum of four minutes, longer pieces had to be split over several discs, and there were also regular holdups when discs had to be changed or equipment broke down. All of this made it exceedingly difficult for musicians to remain in what these days is called the zone. Schnabel called the studio a torture chamber, and his complaints in a letter to his wife are worth quoting, and may still ring a bell of recognition to some people today. One can only play for four minutes. In these four minutes, sometimes 2,000 or more keys are hit. If two of them are unsatisfactory, you have to repeat all of the 2,000. In the repeat, the first 40 notes are corrected, but two others are not satisfactory. So you must play all 2,000 once again. You do it 10 times, always with the sword of Damocles over your head. Finally, you give up and 20 bad notes are left in it. I am physically and mentally too weak for this process and was close to a breakdown. I began to cry when I was alone in the street. I had no idea of how outrageous a process the recording on discs could be. Like slave drivers, they burdened me with six hours of recording on a daily basis. This is crazy. The working conditions are unimaginable. It took Schnabel four years to record all 32 sonatas, and despite the slave drivers and the stress, the results received universal critical acclaim, and were many decades later still declared the standard by which all subsequent performances of Beethoven's sonatas have to be judged. Legendary recordings continued to come out of torture chambers at EMI Studios. The intimacy and performance detail made possible by the microphone made vocalists more important than ever. It also meant that recordings began to transcend the idea of them just being a documentation of a performance. Instead, the microphone heralded a new artistic medium that had a right to exist on its own right. 
the record. As we now know, the record became the dominant medium in pop music, and the first seeds were sown in Studio 2, much later known as the Beatles Studio. Orchestras recorded in Studio 1, and small classical ensembles and individual performers sought out Studio 3, all in the pursuit of what was snobbishly known as proper music. By contrast, Studio 2 was the domain of dance bands, jazz musicians, and popular singers. The microphone increased the emphasis of the identity of the singer, laying the ground for what became known as personality records. For example, the microphone contributed greatly to the career of Al Bowley, widely regarded as Britain's first pop star, most famously as the frontman for the new Mayfair Dance Orchestra. Other popular artists that recorded at EMI Studio during the 30s included Fred Astaire, Fats Waller, Gracie Fields, and Paul Robeson. While scores of artists and musicians were exploring the new artistic possibilities and technical challenges at EMI Recording Studios, the technical department remained busy moving recording technology forward. A major innovator at the company was Alan Blumlein, who invented stereo in 1931, and demonstrated the concept with the first orchestral stereo recording in 1934. The story is he took his wife to the cinema and they saw a film, and obviously the film's on a big screen, and in the middle of the screen, behind, is where the sounds come out. And he said to his wife, I can make those people come out over there and they can run across the screen and come back there and he he got the perception of doing something that uh, is realistic. We have actually got about 44 78 discs of his experiments in our archive and we've even got films, uh, fire engines ringing their bells. Uh, we've got about five films of different things and people walking across a stage talking as they go just to make certain that this is stereo 25, 26 27 28 29 30. however the time was not ripe for his invention and it was forgotten by contrast the stereo pair recording technique that he invented still bears his name and is still used today also in 1931, the Research and Development Department of EMI was asked to replace all the Westrex gear that the studios were using to stop the company having to pay royalties to the American Western Electrics Company. Westrex was a subsidiary. As a result, Bloomline was central to developing the famous HB1B moving coil microphone, mixers, plus new disc recorders, which were weight driven. The quality of Bloomline's equipment was so high that it remained in use in the studio until 1948, when tape technology took over. Bloomline's gear reportedly sounded far smoother than equipment at other studios, which naturally attracted many artists to EMI Studios. On a side note, when future Prime Minister Churchill visited EMI Studios in the late 30s, on seeing that all the staff wore white coats, he joked, My God, I thought I'd come to the wrong place. It looks like a hospital. The studio also had a very strict recording schedule, with sessions from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., 2 p.m. to 5 p.m., and 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. No exceptions or overruns were allowed. A rather stuffy conservatism that would rule in EMI Studios until the Beatles blew it out of the water in the 60s. During World War II, governments deemed the radio and recorded music of crucial importance for their propaganda efforts. While EMI's technical department in Hayes was asked to work on war technology, the morale-boosting effect of music was evident enough for the UK government to encourage EMI Studios to continue to record music, even as only a skeleton crew remained at work. Artists like Gracie Fields, George Formby, Vera Lynn, Flanagan and Allen, and Noel Coward recorded songs at EMI Studios to support the war effort. Many of these recordings were broadcast by the BBC, which declared its aim to achieve victory through harmony. The legendary American band leader Glenn Miller did some sessions at Abbey Road in 1944, weeks before perishing in a flight across the English Channel. In the Allied Nations, the next era of recording, the Magnetic Era, started immediately after the war and came about as a result of the spoils of war. Magnetic tape recording combined two inventions that never had much impact in themselves. 
mechanical recording to wax strips patented in 1886 by Alexander Graham Bell and later to celluloid and photoelectric paper strip recorders, and magnetic wire recording pioneered by Waldemar Paulsen in 1898. The German engineer Fritz Flumer obtained a patent in 1928 on magnetic recording on paper tape coated with iron oxide powder. And in 1932, he granted AEG and BASF the rights to develop his invention. AEG ended up constructing the world's first practical magnetic tape recorder, the Magnetophon K1, which was able to record and reproduce sound at a much higher quality than 78 discs, and also for much longer periods. German engineers had also discovered by accident that high-frequency bias greatly improved sound quality and experimented with stereo tape recordings. During the war, the Allies were spooked by the fact that German radio stations were broadcasting what to them sounded like live recordings at all times of the day. Hitler appeared to be giving speeches in several places at the same time, and orchestras seemed to be playing through the night. They suspected that some kind of advanced recording technology was involved, and after the war, American audio engineer John T. Mullen brought two magnetophon recorders back to the US. Bing Crosby heard a demonstration and was so impressed that he invested $50,000 in the Ampex company to help further develop and produce tape recorders. In 1946, several British audio engineers went to Germany on a fact-finding mission to check out the secrets of German sound recording. Among them was an audio engineer from Abbey Road, E.W. Berth Jones. While the BBC obtained and used some magnetophones for a number of years, the EMI Research Laboratory in Hayes set out to build its own version, based on one magnetophone they were given. The result was the BTR-1, aka British tape recorder number one. Introduced in 1948, it was initially purely used to back up wax disc recordings, as EMI management did not recognize the tape recorder's true potential. The same fate befell some excellent Neumann and AKG microphones brought back from Germany, which were tested for two years before use at EMI Studios was authorized. Around this time, EMI Studios also took delivery of a desk from the Hayes Research Department that cost a thousand pounds to build and allowed the engineer to preset mixing scenes for five microphones each, which could be mixed down to the BTR recorders. In 1951, the EMI R&D department came up with the RS-56 passive equalizer, nicknamed the Curve Bender. It was used as part of the vinyl cutting mastering process, with its effect being more recently remodeled in hardware by Chandler and Waves as a plugin. In 1952, the R&D department came up with the BTR2, which was a vast improvement on the BTR1. It remained in use at Abbey Road and the BBC until the end of the 60s. Because of the loud green color they were painted in, the BTR2 recorders were known as the Green Machines. EMI also had started to produce its own blank and pre-recorded magnetic tapes in many formats, including Type H60 and Type H65. The big deal of tape recorders was not only the greatly improved sound quality and the fact that far longer stretches of music could be recorded, but also that it allowed re-recording on the same tape, and most of all, it made it possible to edit recordings through tape splicing. The late 40s did not only see a revolution in recording equipment, but also in home playback equipment. As Columbia and RCA in America had developed what was called the Micro Groove Record, using a 12-inch vinyl disc that played back at 33 and a third RPM, and was called an LP, meaning long play, as well as the singles format of 7 inches in diameter played at 45 RPM. These discs sounded far better than the Shellac 78s, and the vinyl LP could contain around 23 minutes of music on each side, rather than just four, making it possible to play back longer format music and present a collection of songs. But the suits at EMI again were suspicious and did not release LPs or 45s until 1952, by which time an entire youth culture had sprung up around singles in particular. However, winds of change were beginning to blow at EMI in the 50s, and two recording managers, who would now be called A&R managers, Wally Ridley at HMV and Norman Newell at Columbia brought in many new young artists. They appealed to a young audience, and their music was ideally suited to the new recording and playback technologies. The artists included Petula Clark, Shirley Bassey, and the Beverly Sisters. 
Meanwhile, at Parlophone, the third EMI label, a new assistant was hired in November of 1950 called George Martin. He took over as the head of the label in 1955. The British charts were dominated by American acts at the time, with Elvis Presley, Bill Haley and his Comets, and Little Richard heralding a new era of reverb-drenched, electrically amplified music. With Britain lacking in rock and roll talent, Martin tried to counteract the American dominance by drawing on English comedy talent, like Peter Sellers and Spike Milligan. Martin also managed to tap into Britain's only rock and roll equivalent, skiffle. In the late 50s, there were thousands of skiffle groups in the country, and many later greats of rock, including Mick Jagger, Jimmy Page, Roger Daltrey and Barry Gibb, as well as John Lennon, Paul McCartney and George Harrison of the Quarrymen, cut their teeth in skiffle groups. Eventually, a viable form of British rock and roll started to emerge, spearheaded by Cliff Richard and The Shadows brought to EMI by producer Norrie Paramore and singer Adam Faith, produced by John Burgess. George Martin, Norman Paramore and John Burgess were the driving forces at EMI who recognised that rock and roll marked a completely new approach to making records. Up until that point, professionally written songs, performed by sight-reading session musicians, interpreted by personality singers and played, sung and recorded as cleanly as possible were the gold standard. By comparison, the American rock and roll recordings in particular sounded rough, chaotic, sometimes distorted, but wild and exciting. And young record buyers loved it. It was the start of a new era in which fateful reproduction of what was happening in the studio was no longer the benchmark. Instead, the aim was to create excitement and in its pursuit, anything went. Recording rock and roll required a completely different mindset and new gear. One essential magic box needed to make rock and roll sound great was something called a compressor, which made things sound more in your face and larger than life. The lab technicians in Hayes stripped an Altec compressor to its components, held their noses and came up with something they regarded as far superior. They called their tube compressor the RS-124. The lab technicians involved, Len Page, Bill Livy and Mike Batchelor, made only a few RS-124 units and each sounded different with different attack and release times. The RS-124 units never made their way out of the building and became part of the secret arsenal of studio tools that gave EMI Studios an edge over its competitors. In fact, the sonic imprint of the RS-124 was so great that it was responsible for what became known as the EMI Studio sound. Waves has made a plug-in and, of course, Chandler has made hardware based on the RS-124. And in fact, pretty much all of the equipment at EMI Studios from this era has been replicated by plugins by Waves and hardware by Chandler. In 1955, Len Page founded the Recording Engineering Development Department at EMI, also known as RED. The department came up in 1958 with the first Valve four-channel mixing desk, the RED-17. Mostly masterminded by Peter Berkowitz, it was built around the Telefunken V72 tube mic preamplifier. Capable of outputting stereo, the RED-17 was one of the world's first modern consoles. Later that same year, an update was produced, the RED-37, and in 1964, the engineers at EMI came up with the RED-51. The latter contained RED-47 amplifiers and was placed in Studio 2. It was used on many Beatles recordings until it was replaced by the EMI TG12345 Mark I in 1968. The 37 and 51 models both had eight microphone input channels, two auxiliary channels and four master outputs, which worked perfectly with four-track Studer J37 tape recorders. Studio 2 also graced with a new echo chamber, courtesy of EMI technician Henry Clark and Abbey Road engineer Stuart Eltham, used drain pipes and concrete to get rid of the bathroom effect and was augmented by other red inventions like Steed, single tape and echo delay, and Fight, fader isolated tape echo. In addition, 1957 saw the installation of one of the first EMT-140 reverb plate units. Studio One remained a problem, however. The acoustics had been designed to be as dead as possible, which turned out not to work very well and the removal of some of the padding still did not give the required results. In 1958, the studio experimented with embellishing the acoustics with a system of a hundred speakers called Ambiophony. Around the same time, there was the first experiments with stereo recording, but only in classical music. 
In pop music, two-track tape recorders were used to overdub and balance before mixing to mono. George Martin was considered an expert in carefully balancing the vocals on one track and the instruments on the other to get the perfect mono result. Inevitably, there was a move towards more tracks, and EMI Studios obtained four-track Telefunk and tape machines in 1959, and four Studer J37 one-inch four-track recorders in 1965. The Beatles did not have access to the Telefunken until late 1963, and their earlier recordings were made on the BTR-2. From 1965 until the arrival of the 8-track in 1968, all Beatles recordings were made on the now legendary J37, which was modified by the EMI Lab. The modifications included a socket to be able to connect an oscillator in order to vary tape speed, and an EQ preset switch with the EMI-approved EQ curve. The company also continued to make tape, EMI Tape 888 in the early 60s, EMI Tape 811 from the mid 60s, and EMI Tape 815 in the early 70s. The tape formulations added to the characteristic and celebrated sound coming out of EMI Studios. With the above mentioned technology in place, as well as producers who were excited by the latest developments in popular music, EMI Studios was ready for the most tumultuous and momentous musical events of the 20th century, which would revolutionize music, recording, popular culture in general, and the studio itself. The Beatles were at the heart of these events, and their story is legendary and has been told countless times. So we'll only cover the points here that directly relate to EMI Studios. After a failed audition at Decca on January the 1st, 1962, the band's manager, Brian Epstein, managed to convince George Martin to try them out. On June the 2nd, 1962, the band set up in Studio 2, where they played various takes of four songs. Norman Smith engineered the session, and Ken Townsend was in the technical department on that day. The Beatles also failed this audition but was saved by their personalities and sense of humour. As Martin often worked with British comedy talent and personality records were an important aspect of the recording business, he was alert to the winning effect of band's characters. Martin later remarked, I was convinced that they were star material as live performers, but they had not shown any evidence of what was to come in their way of songwriting. Half a year later, the Beatles enjoyed their first number one single with the self-written Please Please Me. Another 27 UK and US number one singles were to follow. EMI regarded its studios in Abbey Road as a resource rather than a business that needed to make money. An artist signed to the labels could record at the studio for no charge. However, because of the Beatles' staggering commercial success, they were essentially given free reign at the studio and spent a large part of the 60s in their favorite Studio 2 particularly after they stopped touring in 1966 and focused all their creative efforts on recording. EMI Studios was already extraordinarily successful in the beginning days of the Beatles. In 1963, for example, 15 of the 19 UK number one records that year had been recorded at the studio. However, the Beatles took this enormous success to a staggering new level. The Beatles' creative growth during the eight years they recorded at EMI Studios was as remarkable as their commercial success. Their creative powers were expertly nursed by their producer George Martin, with the band drawing extensively on his classical music arrangement skills, as well as on the technical know-how of the engineers and technicians at the studio. As the Beatles' penchant for experimentation took flight, they threw all sorts of technical challenges at what Paul McCartney called the boffins at EMI. Engineer Ken Townsend recalled, they started off with simple two-track, recording voices on one track and the backing on the other. They soon got into the four-track scene and began to revolutionize the very way in which Abbey Road had worked for 30 years. They turned the place into a workshop and used it for rehearsals and songwriting. The technical innovations that were the result of the Beatles pushing the boundaries included close miking the drums and Townsend inventing DI for McCartney's bass. Combined with the RS-124, it was at the heart of McCartney's very recognizable bass sound. To get the required swirling effect on Tomorrow Never Knows from Revolver, the team had tape running between eight tape machines spread over different control rooms, with several people, including the Beatles, maintaining tape tension with pencils. In addition, there was Townsend's most famous invention, artificial double tracking, aka ADT. 
In 1966, John Lennon didn't like the sound of his own voice and was always wanted to double track himself, which took a considerable amount of time and effort, plus several tracks on the Studio J37 tape machine. He asked Townsend if there was another way. Townsend's solution was to take a signal from the sync head, aka the record head of the J37, and send it to a mono BTR2, and using a level TG150M oscillator, apply various speed to the BTR2 to get a signal a few milliseconds apart from the original. When he mixed the two signals together, he could not only make it sound like a double-tracked voice, but also created a phasing or flanging effect, depending on how the various speed was set. And I thought to myself, well, if I took if I took the um, the output from the sync head of a J37, which is excellent quality, you know, superb quality, and I then took the replay head um, and I took that off and fed it into a BTR2, and if I fed that at 30 inches per second, that would shorten the length to about one and a half inches. But not, not only that, I thought, well, if I, if I then put that onto frequency control, I can adjust the speed of the um, of the BTR2 um, to be um, almost exactly the same as the two. And I've got two signals. One is the original signal, and then the same original signal, but delayed by um, about 100 milliseconds, I think, if it's um, one and a half inches out of, out of 15 inches per second. And then that delay, and I can put the two together and see what it sounds like. John Lennon loved the effect and called it Ken's flanger. When stereo came in, the effect was also used to spread a vocal over two speakers. ADT was used on instruments as well, and phasing, flanging, and chorus have since become standard effects on guitars. The ADT effect was first used on the Beatles' Revolver album, released in 1966, and applied on every subsequent album. Their next album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, featured yet more effects, and in order to accommodate the many overdubs that took the track count to way over four, recordings were submixed and bounced between several J37 recorders. Townsend was asked if he could link two four-track machines, and in a crude but visionary forerunner of later simpty based tape machine link-up formats, he used a 50 Hz tone to synchronize two tape recorders for a day in the life. A Day in the Life is a good example of the way George Martin and the Beatles worked. It was made up of 14 audio tracks in total, as can be seen in this Pro Tools screenshot of audio transfers of the original four-track tapes, which were done for Giles Martin and Sam Ockel's 50th anniversary remix of Sgt Pepper's in 2017. In green at the top is a rhythm track containing acoustic guitar, shaker, bongos and some piano, and three vocal tracks. They are submixed and edited to two tracks on a second four-track tape, which is underneath, with the submixed tracks greyed out, as they were copies and Martin Ockel went back to the first generation original tracks of the first tape for their remix. The band overdubbed a bass and drums on another track and there is an additional orchestra track. Both are in blue. The legendary orchestral section was recorded on one four-track and is in red. The band later decided to add a final chord played on pianos and a harmonium, which are the four tracks in purple at the bottom right. In addition to all the technical innovations on Sgt Pepper's, the album sparked a cultural sea change. The Beatles had already transformed the way in which things were done at EMI Studios, knocking out most of the cobwebs that were left of 50s conservatism. The white coats had become a distant memory. The lab coat, white lab coat, was hanging behind the door <laughs> of Len Pages. That's where I was. Right. And it was always hanging there. It was never taken off the door. <clears throat> so, um, yes, it, you've got photographs of uh, engineers with white lab coats, and the sweeper uppers had brown lab coats, or not lab coats, brown, which differentiated the people from each other. Gus Cook, who had become studio manager in 1969, finally lifted the suits and ties required for the staff. Artists were now in charge, and even in a complete break of decades-long protocol, allowed in a control room and to touch the mixing console. Sgt Peppers also was very deliberately presented as one coherent piece of work, rather than a collection of songs, and reinforced the idea of the album as a unique art form. On top, Sgt Peppers furthered the idea of the studio as a creative instrument, or as Martin put it, a permanent experimental thing. 
As a result, recordings were now regarded as standalone fantasies and did not even try to resemble a live performance or attempt to be playable live. Incorporating an overwhelming amount of sounds and musical influences, the album was a kaleidoscope masterpiece, which laid down the blueprint for rock albums for decades to come. For all Sgt. Pepper's visionary aspects, it seems amazing that the Beatles still regarded mono as the dominant format when it came to mixing the album. Jeff Emmerich, George Martin and the Four Beatles spent three weeks mixing Sgt. Pepper's to mono and left Emmerich to his own devices when he later quickly did the stereo mix, which clearly was regarded as an afterthought. Even more amazing was the fact by 1968 some cobwebs still remained at the EMI studios as management resisted the move towards 8-track, despite having a 3M M23 8-track standing somewhere in the building. It was still unboxed as protocol demanded that it be tested for many months before it could be used. The Beatles were eager to try out 8-track recording, and after recording some songs on EMI's studio's Studer J37, the band decamped to Trident Studios in London to record Hey Jude and Dear Prudence on that studio's 8-track. Engineer Ken Scott subsequently installed the 8-track 3M recorder in EMI Studio 2 without authorization from management. The Beatles' 11th studio album and the last they recorded together, Abbey Road, was their first recorded entirely to 8-track and mixed only to stereo. The recordings and mix made use of the newly installed 20-input EMI TG12345 Mark I desk that had been designed to work with 8-track tape recorders. Outboard gear that was used on Beatles recordings in the late 60s included RS-124 and Fairchild 660 compressors, RS-127 Brilliance Control and an EMT-140 plate. Of course, while the Beatles were busy changing music and recording practices at EMI Studios, many others were doing the same. The counterculture and rock and roll revolution were in full swing, and artists like Donovan, Pretty Things, Jeff Beck, Rod Stewart, Deep Purple, and Pink Floyd could all be found recording at EMI Studios trying out new approaches. In 1970, EMI Studios updated its mastering facilities with the EMI TG Mastering Chain, which featured the transistor-based EMI TG12410 transfer console. It was used for decades. It's been the mainstay of my room and Abbey Road's mastering rooms uh, since 1973, is it? 72, 73. So it's, it's all I know. You know, and, and, it, and it does everything that it's that it's supposed to in a very nice and gentle way. And then, you know, we team it up with uh, more modern pieces of gear, uh, both uh, transistor as well as valves, because valves are fun. EMI management still resisted the drive towards more tracks, having opted for an 8-track tape machine recorders at a time when 16-track machines were already available. Ampex had brought out the world's first production model 16-track on the market in 1968, the MM1000, and acts like Blood, Sweat and Tears, the Grateful Dead Jefferson Airplane and Frank Zappa eagerly used it. The 24-track version of the MM1000 became available a year later in 1969. In the UK, AdVision and Trident installed the first 16-track recorders at the end of 1969, and other London studios soon followed. EMI Studios, however, took a while to catch up. Pink Floyd's album Atom Heart Mother, recorded in the first half of 1970 with staff engineer Alan Parsons, still used an 8-track and an EMI TG12345 desk. Early in 1971, Pink Floyd started working on metal. Frustrated by the 8-track recorders and use at EMI Studios, they moved to Morgan Studios and Air Studios, the latter being a central London facility founded by George Martin, who had left EMI in 1965 as the company refused to pay him royalties for his production work with the Beatles. It was as late as May 1972 when sessions at EMI Studio 2 began for Dark Side of the Moon that Pink Floyd and Parsons had a Studer a80 16-track tape recorder available to them, as well as a desk that has since become legendary, a 40-channel EMI TG12345 Mark IV desk. It has limiter compressors on each channel, four echo returns, and 16 monitor channels. It has been called the best-sounding desk in history and went to producer Mike Hedges after being sold in 1983. In 2017, it fetched an amazing 1.8 million at an auction. 
Dark Side of the Moon is a testimony to the quality of the TG12345 desk, as well as to the engineering skills of Alan Parsons, who also played a part in finding the many non-musical sounds on the album, coins in money, clocks in time, that were a precursor to the way samples started to be used 10 years later. The album was mixed in a first surround format quad, which died an early death. Many more classic albums were recorded in the early 70s in EMI Studios, including Deep Purple in Rock, George Harrison All Things Must Pass, Fela Kuti's Aphrodisiac, Pink Floyd's Wish You Were Here, and Al Stewart's Modern Times, to just name a few. In terms of staying with modern times, Ken Townsend became studio manager in 1974 and began a campaign to renew the studio in many ways. There was, for an example, a complete refurbishing as the studio, which was now colloquially referred to as Abbey Road, had earned itself the rather uncomplimentary nickname Shabby Road. In 1976, Townsend also was instrumental in the decision to change the name of the studio officially to Abbey Road Studios. As the 70s progressed, new equipment arrived at the studio, including a 48-channel Neve in Studio 3, the first non-EMI desk within its walls. There was also the opening of the Penthouse Studio on the top floor in 1980, with Windows a novel feature at the time. In the 1980s, a 56-input SSL 4000E was installed in the control rooms for both Studio 1 and 2, and a 48-channel Calrec in Studio 3, replaced by a 72-channel SSL in 1992, around the same time Studio 1 and 2 both had Neve VRP desks installed. Kate Bush spent a lot of time in Studio 2 recording around 1980 for her third album, Never Forever, which incorporated samples from the pioneering Fairlight CMI. At the same time, Abbey Road management was extremely concerned that the fact that Studio 1 was often standing empty to the point that it was regularly used for table tennis matches by artists working in the other studios. Various solutions were being dreamed up, including plans to turn Studio One into a car park. But a hookup with film production company Anvil Films saved the day. The collaboration turned Studio One into a popular place for orchestral movie score recording and still today is one of the world's premier film recording facilities. Film scores recorded there in the 80s including those for Return of the Jedi and Raiders of the Lost Ark, Amadeus, Braveheart, The Last Emperor and many more. It led to a complete revamp of the control room of Studio One in 1985, with the above mentioned 56 channel SSL and all manner of technical facilities for film score recording. Later in the 80s, the introduction of the CD resulted in a rise in popularity of classic music, which led to a renaissance of classical orchestral recording in Studio One. The arrival of the CD in the early 80s was, of course, part of the digital revolution that would spell the end of the magnetic recording era. In studios, digital recording had already begun with the introduction in 1971 of the Denon DN023R 8-track tape recorder with 13-bit resolution and a 47.25K sample rate. The first commercially available multi-track was a 3M32 track, and the 80s saw the Mitsubishi X800, X850, and X880 32 tracks, and the Sony PCM 3324-track and 3348-48 track machines. The latter became close to music industry standard. Abbey Road's first 3348s arrived in 1989, and it would have several more, as well as several Mitsubishi 32 track machines. Studer, Otari, and Tascam issued their own digital multitracks, and there were also cassette formats with tape in plastic casings like DAT and the Elisis ADAT and Tascam DA88. Steely Dan engineer Roger Nichols complained at one point that he could not keep up with all the digital formats, and listed PCM F1, DAT, DBX, 3M, CD, PD, DASH, MP3, DSD, DTS, AC3, MLP, MPEG2, DVD, DV, DV Pro, DSD, DVDA, SD2, WAVE, AIFF. It'd be easy to list several dozen more, and there eventually were dozens of professional digital recording and sound treatment formats. It would need a separate long-form video to cover them in any kind of depth. The late 80s and 90s marked a high point of the recording industry in terms of revenue, as CDs sold in large quantities, often containing remastered versions of albums that had already made record companies a lot of money. 
and a repeat of the entire exercise, over time, newly remastered CDs of many of the same albums were released. As it turned out, early digital didn't sound that good, and people wanted things louder. The capacity to make profit from re-releasing and re-re-releasing the past was exemplified in the Beatles' three anthology albums, released in 1995 and 1996, with outtakes, rarities, live performances, and so on. They were curated and mixed by Martin engineer Jeff Emmerich and the remaining three Beatles, using the original equipment in Studio 2 from the 60s. These albums made EMI more money than any other releases during the years of their release, and boosted an entire industry of releases with remasters, remixes, and outtakes. The enormous amount of money generated during this time caused what has been called an arms race in the recording world, with studios arming themselves to the teeth with the best digital equipment money could buy, and technical specs the main criterion for hiring a studio. Abbey Road Studios was no exception. However, the digital revolution initially created an amount of wealth that the music makers and record companies could not have imagined. The downturn soon followed. It started at the beginning of the century as first downloading and then streaming became the dominant ways for people to consume music and resulting in a dramatic loss of revenue. Moreover, the hundreds of digital recording formats were all eventually largely superseded with the digital audio workstation, with the arrival of Pro Tools in 1991 and Cubase in 1993. Over time, the DAW era created its own revolution as it made professional quality recording equipment affordable for pretty much anyone, and offered the capacity to edit in ways that had never been possible, and apply the effects and treatments and manipulation and restoration work that we today take for granted. As we know, studios lost their monopoly in professional standard gear, and many closed. Big studios like Abbey Road faced, and still face, major challenges to remain relevant and financially viable. The shock of the announcement in 2010 that the owners of Abbey Road wanted to sell the studio for property development was therefore not entirely surprising. The worldwide outrage that followed was instrumental in averting the oafish plan. Abbey Road's ongoing success in 2023 is built on a combination of its legendary brand name, a culture of professionalism, experience, and know-how built up over more than 90 years, always staying on top of new technology and musical developments, diversification, and the intangible magic that continues to attract countless artists to work there, and tens of thousands of people who walk across the zebra crossing outside. In terms of diversification, the amount of studios at Abbey Road has greatly expanded. Studio One, now sporting a 72-channel AMS Neve 88 RS Desk is still going strong with many classical music and film music orchestral recordings, including the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Studio 2 has a 60-channel AMS Neve 88 RS and has been used this century by the likes of Coldplay, George Ezra, Ed Sheeran, and Sam Smith. Studio 3 has been completely redesigned and now has an SSL G Plus Desk and saw Amy Winehouse, Lady Gaga, Florence and the Machine, Frank Ocean, Dua Lipa, and many more in action. The Penthouse Studio is fitted with a Dolby Atmos system and is promoted as a multi-purpose creative space. Nile Rogers, Burner Boy, Mark Ronson, Nick Cave, and many others have all worked there. On top, Abbey Road Studios now has The Gatehouse, which is a tracking studio, and The Front Room, which is once part of Studio 3, is designed as an accessible creative space. Abbey Road has also taken on management of another studio in North London, Angel Studios, that is known for orchestral projects. Abbey Road has also opened the Mixed Stage, a Dolby Atmos accredited and IMAX audio compatible studio, with 44 speakers and seven Pro Tools systems, that is London's only facility to offer movie scoring and sound post-production facilities. In addition to all of this, Abbey Road houses five mastering rooms. The main thinker behind the room is Dan Cole, who's uh, on the technical team, um, and he's incredible. And he knows all about all of this stuff. And this room was built kind of in the image of the penthouse. A vinyl service with four VMS-80 cutting lathes, a live director vinyl service, restoration services, and pioneering demix technology that was developed by technical analyst James Clark with the help from Abbey Road engineers. 
Since 2010, Abbey Road has collaborated with Waves and Softube to make plugins that recreate the sonic impact of the gear that has been developed over the years by RED and EMI Research Department. Much of this gear is also produced as hardware in collaboration with Chandler Limited. And in 2021, Abbey Road acquired the famous Audio Movers software that facilitates remote collaboration. There's also the company's RED Initiative, named after RED. R-E-D-D department in the 50s that aims to find and nurture early stage business who we think will introduce the next generation of universally adopted technologies into the music business. And there's the Abbey Road Institute, a music production and audio engineering school that operates in London, Paris, Amsterdam, Miami, Sydney, Frankfurt and Johannesburg and more places soon to follow. In short, the magic and mystique of Abbey Road Studios does not only continue in its original building, but is spreading all over the world. It will undoubtedly contribute to more technical innovations and more spellbinding music being made in even the most unexpected places. I don't know what else to say other than going to Abbey Road and being able to walk around and talk to engineers and everybody there, the assistants, and just being able to soak up the atmosphere is been one of the greatest experiences of my life. Yes, I'm a huge Beatles fan. I'm also a huge Pink Floyd fan, but I'm also a huge engineering and production fan. And so being in those rooms where Norman Smith and Jeff Emmerich and John Kurlander and of course Alan Parsons and so many more, Ken Townsend, made incredible albums is awe-inspiring. Awe-inspiring. It is one of the greatest moments of my life and I really, really hope you enjoyed this video. Please leave any comments and questions down below. Thank you ever so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you all again very soon. So long, farewell, Avida Zen, au revoir, Tosians, ciao, Avida Zen, tschüss, goodbye.